Okay, it's good to be here again speaking to you. I'll tell you this, this passage, though it's only three, three verses, um, wow, it sent me in so many directions as I was studying, so many fingers off the lake. You know, I, my, my aunt used to take us to Lake Mead and uh, we used to chase these fingers off the side of the lake and that's what I felt like this week. I kept chasing these fingers. Um, and, and thinking, how am I going to pull this back? How, I need to pull this back. Um, it's good. Praise God. Uh, hopefully, he'll help me pull this all, all back. Um, we are on the last message, uh, a message direct, directed uh, to Zerubbabel, not to the, the, the people, not to uh, Haggai or Joshua, but specifically to Zerubbabel. Uh, my wife posted on our uh, the friends group this week or today actually um, a quote that goes something like um, believe in God's plan so much so that if things don't go your way you don't get angry do you believe in God's plan that he has a master plan that we're just playing a part of and do you believe in it enough to go through the pain to let that plan happen that's kind of what the people went through throughout the book of Haggai. They left their, their homes uh, in, uh, in Babylon, now Persia. They returned for the purpose of God's plan of constructing the temple. But difficulty hit them. People, the locals were, were fighting against them to stop this. And they stopped and they backed off and they went to their own homes and they built, they started building their own comfortable homes until Haggai had to step in and called them back to God's plan. Said, you got to come back. You need to repent and be a part of God's plan. And they did establish the temple. They start sacrificing. Uh, Haggai starts talking about some prophetic messages and and here we are with with Zerubbabel speaking to Zerubbabel and uh, this message kind of falls into two sections verses uh, 20 and 22 is the Lord reigns and verse 23 is the Lord restores and so I I uh, very imaginatively named it named this sermon the Lord reigns and the Lord restores that much thought. Um, so we're going to look at this passage in two parts, those two parts. Some of us come from some pretty interesting families. And truth be known, we could be a little embarrassed to introduce our friends to our families or to bring our, our girlfriend home for the first time to meet our families. We might be a little embarrassed. In fact, you might have that relative in your family that um, has done something so bad you don't even mention this guy, person's name you don't talk about him um we're going to see how today how Zerubbabel had one of those people in his family actually he had a whole string of people like that in his family and that those failures play a key part in this message to Zerubbabel and since our passage is directed probably should take out the, the controller. Since our passage today is directed to Zerubbabel, it is key, okay, wait, that we get to know Zerubbabel a little bit before we continue. And just briefly, let's run through. Uh, Zerubbabel led the first uh, group of Jews, numbering uh, 42,000 plus who returned from the Babylonian captivity uh, in the first year of Cyrus the Great. He is a contemporary to Joshua, the high priest. Uh, HP is high priest, not Harry Potter. It's high priest and Haggai, the prophet. And they worked together as a team uh, to get this temple rebuilt. He was sanctioned, sorry, he, he was a governor of Judah 
us. And he was the governor of Judah only because the prince of Persia allowed him to be the governor of Judah. And that's a, that's a key point. He was the governor of Judah under the uh, Persian king. Um, he was given a sanction to rebuild the temple and to return the vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had preserved after the conquest of Babylon. The temple rebuilding project starts strong, as we read, but because of the opposition and faint hearts, it stopped, and the people's work started on their own homes. And then finally, 15 years later, that's how long they spent on their own homes, not building the temple. 15 years, the temple then was taken up again and ultimately completed, albeit it's a smaller version. This was in 516 B.C. As the people in Zerubbabel responded to the Lord's call through Haggai's preaching. Zerubbabel is a direct descendant uh, of King David and in the lineage of Jesus. And this is a key part of today's message. His grandfather was Coniah or Jehoiachin or Jeconiah, depending on where you're reading it in Scripture. These are different names used for the same person. He's the last true royal king of Israel. There's one person right after him, but he wasn't really the true king because he was placed there by the Babylonians. So that's where we are. So continuing, uh, this Jehoiachin is his grandfather. Some, just, some context about this guy. The Old Testament, just to, to, to build up to this, the Old Testament is filled with prophecies, uh, foreshadowings of God's use of Israel in his grand plan. God told Abraham that he would make him a great nation. He would give him a land. He would, he, he would uh, bless him, and he blessed all those who blessed him. And through him, he would bless the nations. He would send a servant, the Messiah, a blood descendant of Abraham through David. And we know this person to be Jesus. This promise was reiterated to Isaac and Jacob and to Joseph and through the prophets. And then God's people demanded a king. And so God gave him a king and uh, Saul came and failed. And King David came and restored the, the, the promise and he becomes a symbol of the conquering king who they think the, this Messiah is going to be. He was a foreshadowing of who, who this Messiah was going to be. But then came a series of evil kings, the, 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 the kingdom splits, of course. And let's look at specifically Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Zerubbabel's grandfather, who was, I said, the last Davidic king of Judah. He was, shall we say, the straw that broke the camel's back. He's known as one of the evil kings, like I said, of Judah. There's a string of like five. Well, actually, there's a string of a ton of evil kings with good kings somewhere spattered in there. But there's like a string of five, evil king, evil king, evil king. And, and this finally, uh, Zerubbabel's grandfather just God said, enough. Kanoya, uh, sorry, Kan, uh, not Kanye, <laughs> Je uh, Jeconiah, was a king whom God said, enough. He, God had, had, some, had enough. God had some pretty harsh words for this king of Judah. And let's look at them up here. He says, as I live. Though Kaniah, the son of Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pluck him off. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, 
a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. And it's super important that we read that in context and in context and for what it actually says. Um, some have misinterpreted it in the same, well, God says that Kaniah, Kaniah, I don't know why I've lost the pronunciation of that word. Uh, Zerubbabel's grandfather is cursed as being childless. And therefore, what they say is the, the genealogy in Matthew that has this guy involved, uh, as part of the genealogy is wrong. And therefore, they, they challenge the authenticity of Scripture. Well, if you look at the Scripture, what it says is mark him down as childless as if he was childless. Why? Why does he say that? He says the effect will be as if he was childless. Why? Because none of his descendants would ever again sit as a, on the royal throne of David. And true enough, Kaniah marked the last sovereign king of Israel. All other rulers in Israel have ruled only by permission under a greater king. Like Zerubbabel, who's the governor of, of Persia, he was under the Persian king. All other rulers. Today, it's the same. There's no king in Israel. It's a parliamentary system. Uh, we have a prime minister who rules at the behest of the parliament. Not under a sovereign God. So how would you like to be the grandson of the guy who lost the kingdom forever because of his bad behavior? So what does this mean for him? What does this mean for the broken line of the Messiah? The people have rest have, were restored to the land. The temple has been restored. And as we saw last week, God is promising blessing to the people. But there's this one little thing, and that's the promise of the Messiah. Is he still coming? The royal line of David has been interrupted. It was cut off when we were sent to Babylon. God tore off the signet ring which meant the role of Kaniah's bloodline, of David's bloodline, of being the seal of God, the identifying representation of God, was over. That's where Zerubbabel is right now. This, let me just brief thing about a signet ring. Signet ring was the king's authority. It was a symbol in the seal of his royal authority. When Joseph was second in charge of Egypt, he had the king's signet ring. And anything Joseph wanted done, all he had to do is take that signet ring, stamp it, and it would be done. Anything short of insurrection, of course. But in this case, it's Kaniah in the royal, royal line of the Messiah was not just the stamp of the signet ring. It was God's signet ring. That royal line was God's interaction with man. That was how God represented himself in the world, in his creation. And in Jeremiah 22:24. He removes it. This is what, what may have been going through Zerubbabel's mind. What about this royal bloodline, my bloodline, the Messiah's bloodline? We, we lost the, the royal, the kingdom. And with all of this as a backdrop, let's turn and look at our, our, uh, our verse, verses today. First of all, let's pray. 
Father God, I pray that you would speak your word and you would use your word to encourage, challenge, and change us, Lord. I, I pray, Lord, that the, 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 this message of your plan, the, the message of you being in control, shines through clearly today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to read um, and kind of take it one, just do the section, talk about it, do the section, talk about it, and then uh, pull it all together. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. By the way, this is the same day that last week's message happened. The same day he, he kind of turns aside and he says, Zerubbabel, this is for you. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. Oh, yeah, let me, I'm sorry. Let me stop there. It's not like he said, come here, Zerubbabel. I got a private message for you. He didn't pull Zerubbabel into a private room and had a private message. He's basically, he's, uh, I, I really believe that the message, he's speaking in front of the people, but to Zerubbabel. He's making a point, and we'll see what that point is. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and the riders and the horses and the riders shall go down. Everyone by the sword of his brother. Everyone by the sword of his brother. Sorry, that's a little cut off there, but I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth. Another uh, way to translate this is saying, I'm ready to shake. The Hebrew construction here is the emphasis that God, there's nothing stopping him from doing this next this thing. He is just waiting for whatever he's waiting for. He's God. Um, he's waiting, I believe, for the last person who's going to be saved, to be saved. He's waiting for his plan to play out. And the only person who knows that full plan is himself. And so the, this is an imminent thing. He is going to shake the heavens and the earth imminently. It's going to happen. He's not waiting anymore. Shaking refers to the throwing things into absolute upheaval. Think of God giving the world governments and system of violent shaking. Nothing without a firm foundation is going to last. Uh, in, the, in the Bible, shaking is always associated with some kind of a theophany, some kind of an appearing of God. It's a, a dramatic appearance of the Lord Almighty. Uh, the, the stem to shake occurs in Judges 5, 4 and 2 Samuel 22, 8. In the context, the Lord appears as a divine warrior. And then in other passages like uh, um, Psalms 18, 7 and, and Isaiah 13, 13 and Jeremiah 10, 10, Yahweh comes... The Lord comes in his anger, in his wrath. So shaking is, 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 is a prophetic term referring to God rocking the world, coming against his enemies. This shaking includes overthrowing thrones of kingdoms, destroying the strengths of kingdoms, overthrowing the chariots and the horses and the riders, causing them to turn on themselves, everyone, by the sword of his brother. Have we seen this before? A couple of times. Judges 7.22, when God's plan was for Gideon to have 300 men blow trumpets at an overwhelming force, 
And at the sound of the, of the trumpets, the Midianites attacked each other and fled from the presence of the Israelites. In 2 Corinthians, I mean, Chronicles 20, when the Moab and Ammon teamed up with the inhabitants of Mount Seir and attacked Judah, again, an overwhelming force. Jehoshaphat, the king of Jude, Israel, was scared. He knew there's no way we can overcome this. And so he went to the Lord, and the Lord showed up. It says in verse 22 to 23, And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were routed. And how were they routed? For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, their compatriots, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another, each other. So it's not unprecedented that God destroys nations from within. In fact, the ultimate humiliation for a nation is when they tear themselves apart. God's enemies will not stand before him. And according to this verse, ultimately, they will divide themselves and crush from within, be destroyed from within. This is one of those prophecies that has kind of a double fulfillment, meaning today's, this passage. Uh, it has kind of a double fulfillment. It's, it's one is talking about Christ coming back as a servant king. His grace and redemption made available on the cross and the tearing of the veil and the, the, the Holy Spirit coming to earth and allowing redemption through the transformation of people's hearts. And that rocked our world. The world before Pentecost, before Jesus, was a completely different world than what we know now. There was no Holy Spirit in the world holding back evil. Okay, um, You think it's bad now. It was bad then. It was really bad then. And the church, when the church came, the church changed governments. The church transformed the landscape of this world. But more so, I think that this prophecy is foreshadowing Christ's second coming. When he comes as a conqueror, and makes his enemies his footstools. God's enemies cannot stand before him. What this means is if, if you're on God's side, we're on the winning side. All this was happening now. I was just lamenting yesterday uh, what shape our, the, my country, America, is in. But all of this is... Nothing compared to the amazing victory God's going to have. If you don't know Christ, you're not a follower of His, hear this warning. There's a time coming when time is over. There's a time coming when you won't have a chance to turn to Him anymore. Don't be one of those who say, oh, I'll do that later. I'll do that just before I die. When I'm on my deathbed, I'll, I'll accept Christ. Don't be like that. I have a friend who, who died, and I pray he accepted Christ. But he had a heart attack. He died face down in the middle of the street. No, you have no idea when God's going to take you home. You're either a follower of His or you're not. There's no in between. There's not. I'm almost a Christian. I'm a Christian because of what I do. No, it's based on Jesus Christ. 
He doesn't want anyone playing games. The Bible says that he will spit you out of his mouth if he feels you're playing game, if you're playing games with him. You cannot hustle God. You cannot hustle God. Ultimately, he wins. And if we're not on his side, we're on the wrong side. Verse 23, one verse, but what a verse. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Shealtiel was Kaniah's son and Zerubbabel's father. Shealtiel was a king of, or a leader of Israel, but again, under the Persian rule. Um, but here we have several expressions that I want to look at before we pull it together. Um, this expression, on that day, this expression on that day is an expression that's associated with the day of the Lord, that mighty day of God's judgment. The day when uh, Jesus comes in clouds and sets up his new kingdom, laying waste to all of his enemies. This phrase refers to a time of the Lord's unmistakable and powerful intervention in world history. He's going to come and he's going to set up his kingdom. The kingdom that Zerubbabel maybe feel, may feel that he lost, that my grandfather lost. There's coming a time when I'm going to set up that kingdom. And it's going to be so much better than David's kingdom. It's going to be an amazing kingdom. And, and all of our enemies will be our footstool. All of our enemies. He also uses this term my servant. Zerubbabel is called my servant. The designation servant or servant of the Lord is applied to a very select people of, who are divinely appointed figures in the Old Testament. People like Abraham in Genesis 26, 24, Isaac and Jacob in Exodus 32, and Moses in Numbers, and Joshua and David. And, and others who, who moved along God's kingdom, God's promise. These are, are central figures in God's redemptive story. This would have been very encouraging for Zerubbabel to hear. To say, hey, despite my grandfather losing the kingdom, despite me failing to get the people to rebuild the temple and Haggai having to step in and preach this message to rally the troops to, uh, to finish this temple. Despite all of that, I'm still called his servant. I'm still a key part of his plan. So the term here is, ooh, that got switched together. Is, it's kind of telling Zerubbabel, you're still a key part of my plan, my redemptive plan. We've kind of talked about the signet ring. As we saw earlier, the, the royal kingship was cast away in the image of, of God removing uh, Zerubbabel's grandfather as his signet ring. But here, God reverses that and tells Zerubbabel that he will be God's signet ring once more. In that day, as Zerubbabel's grandfather, Kaniah, uh, was a signet ring that was removed, represented the cessation of this royal line. So Zerubbabel represents the continuation of the royal line. God didn't cut it off. He kind of set it aside. And he said, Zerubbabel, you're continuing this. How encouraging for Zerubbabel to hear. In that day, 
Zerubbabel becomes a picture of the future Messiah, Jesus Christ, who will establish his people in the promised land, construct an even grander temple, and lead the righteous in a never-ending never worship. The signet ring represents that Messiah's royal line has been restored. And then he says, Zerubbabel, I have chosen you. I have chosen you. You might feel like you messed up. You weren't able to be that, that perfect leader who, who rallies the, the people and keeps them going to build my temple, even though they're being assaulted by the, the various pressures. You weren't able to fulfill that, but I choose you. You're part of my plan. It's not based on Zerubbabel. Uh, it's not based on Zerubbabel's efforts or strength or works. It's based on God's plan. He chose Zerubbabel. God chooses whom He chooses. His plan is based on His choice, not our work. Zerubbabel sees that. God ultimately restores according to his plan, according to his own choosing. Let's look at that again. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. I'm going to put you back on my signet ring. I have chosen you, Jose, and make you like a signet ring. I, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord. Hosts. Haggai. This is the last message. Haggai. And Haggai, wow. Two chapters, but so much in this book. I had no idea there's so much in, in the book of Haggai. Um, Haggai, we look at the idea that God reigns. He reigns over the rulers of this world, of the rulers of nations. He reigns over the powers to be. He reigns over history itself. He's in control. He set the Israelite people aside, just like he took the Israelite people, put them in Egypt so that they can develop into a nation and brought them out. He took them, put them into Babylon so that the nation would lessen. So that when his Messiah came, it would be focused on the Messiah, not the nation. I, that's, that's my interpretation of the reason. He also restores. He restores his people to the land. He restores his temple as he promised. And he restores his promise to Zerubbabel. And you know what? He, he can restore us too. We find ourselves having difficulty or in troubles and trials and tribulation. You know what? That doesn't catch God by surprise. He knew COVID was coming. In fact, COVID is part of his plan. How? I don't know. But I'm sure the Israelite people are saying, how in the world is us being in Babylon, being captured part of his plan? It is. In fact, it says specifically God raised up Babylon for that very purpose. God raised up, God raised up COVID. Why? I don't know. I don't know God's plan completely, but you know what? I believe in God's plan enough to allow God to be sovereign over COVID and using COVID for his purposes could be purifying the church, could be probably is a thousand things. God works in so many different ways. And I just don't know. We don't know for sure. We can see some, some of his works. God is sovereign. He has a plan. He's executing this plan. And his plans cannot be thwarted, cannot be stopped. 
uh, we are his workmanship, created to do good works. And those works are part of his plan. Ephesians 2.10. It says, humble yourself and take, your cross, take up your cross daily and follow him. Follow his plan. Not your plan, Luke 9.23. How do you know his plan? Well, you read his word as much as you can. Study it. Listen to it. Immerse yourself in, in God's word. The more you know God's word, the more sure you can be of what his plan is. And notice I didn't say his plan for your life. His plan for your life is intricately tied into his plan for history. Get to know his plan, and then you'll know what he wants you to do. Get to know his plan, and then you'll know what he wants you to do. So that's Haggai, a book of transformation, a book of God's plan being carried out. And it challenges us to know God, to know that God is in control. God has a plan. Zerubbabel thought, oh, I'm not even good enough to get God's people to do the job. But God said, it's okay. I'm in control. I choose you. And God chooses us to use us in ways that we don't even know. But if you get to know his word, you can see what he's doing. We used to say at, at TIS, we used to, uh, leadership used to say, we, we look for where God's working and we join him in it. And that's what our job is, is to find where God's working and join him in that plan. And the way we as individuals know where God's working is to get to know his word. Get to know Jesus better and you'll be able to join him in his work. Father God, I praise you and I ask you that you would challenge every one of us to a deeper relationship with you so that we can be so confident in your plan that nothing rocks our world because we know you're in control. Help us be so confident in you, not in us, not in our circumstances, not in our abilities, but confidence should be based on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we all rise up for the for the last song?
Though troubles linger still, oh, shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always My strength is in your name.